Hello, hello, you guys. Welcome. So excited for you guys to be participating with me this week. I have just been blown away by the incredible response. How many of you guys are jumping in and participating with us this week from all over the world? How many of you are jumping up, saying yes to creating change, to creating empowerment, to creating massive transformation in your life? I'm so grateful to be part of this journey and being your guide throughout the week. I am um, so excited to bring my passion, to bring my excitement, to bring my knowledge, and I really am going to bring it as though you were sitting here with me live right now doing an actual you know, paid training with me. I'm going to bring all of that goodness to you this week here in, um, in, these, online, on these, in these online coaching calls and training. So my name is Charla Snow. I am an NLP master practitioner and trainer. So let's jump in right now and let's start by talking about what that even means. So NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming. And NLP is a set of practical, super practical tools and techniques that act as metaphors to the unconscious mind, which means they can be extremely useful for creating fast and efficient change with people so that they can make dramatic changes in their life. NLP is honestly a very much of a shift in thinking. It's a way of thinking that may be quite different than the norm out there. And at its foundation, it is the concept of personal power. That's really what it's all about. And we help people to find their source of personal power. If you and as you start to fully embrace the positive mindset and paradigm, I guess, if you will, of NLP, then a whole new magical world of unlimited potential and possibilities and, you know, just untapped potential will instantly become available to you. The tools and techniques that I'm talking about are, are things that we do in coaching sessions that directly communicate with your unconscious mind. These are techniques that work with the unconscious mind, which is where, by the way, all habits, all behavior, and all change actually occurs, not in the conscious mind. So you're going to have an opportunity this week to experience a few of these te techniques that I'm referring to. And if you want to continue learning more or even learning how to help others by using these techniques, then of course, you know how to contact me and you can reach out to me to learn more about that. Um, you know, but because you're here, just because by being here, I know you already have um, you know, an open mind. You already have an open mind. You're curious. You're curious to learn more about everything and how everything fits together. Am I right? I think it's fair to say that NLP requires a fairly significant change in the typical thought processes of people that live by the general society of rules. One of the biggest factors and the biggest differences is how we view personal responsibility, which is something that I'm going to be talking to you a lot about today. And the question you may be asking is, can NLP change your life? Can it? No, actually it can't. However, I will say that as you begin to learn this week and as you continue to go on and to learn more and as you take this further learning, with that, you can make your life whatever it is that you want it to be. So let's get into right away jumping into what are the themes of NLP? What are these themes that we're going to be talking about today? We're going to start with the communication model. We're going to talk about cause and effect, which is also empowerment. We're going to be talking about perception is projection. We're going to be talking about the mind body connection and how neurotransmitters bathe every cell in your body. We're also going to be talking about whose responsibility is it to create change. And we're going to wrap up with talking about beliefs. So that's what we have on the agenda for today. Let's jump right in now with one of the big concepts in NLP, which is the NLP communication model. And you've seen this before, right? I've shared this many times before. It's a really 
um, eye-opening model that describes and shows you how exactly how we unconsciously create our state, our behaviors, and therefore our results in life. And as I said, I've already introduced you to the basic understanding of the NLP communication model, but today we're going to really dive deep into really understanding this model and how it works in your life. Because honestly, it is the foundation of how we create results and how we can take full control and full responsibility over those results and operate from a point of massive personal power. Okay, so the NLP communication model, let's jump into the slides. The NLP communication model shows us how huge amounts of data is handled and filtered through our nervous system. As you start to examine this model, you'll see that an external event enters our neurology through our five senses, which are the things that we see, the things that we hear, feel, taste, and smell. Next, all of this data, right? All of this data that makes up our experience is very efficiently filtered at the unconscious level. How is it filtered? What is it being filtered by, you ask? Well, it is filtered by our unconscious values, our unconscious and conscious beliefs, attitudes, our memories, our past experiences, metaprograms, and also decisions. We're going to be talking a lot about decisions today. Let me repeat that again. Your existence, your experiences, everything that you're experiencing in life is being filtered by your unconscious values, beliefs, attitudes, memories, metaprograms, and decisions. Now, as all of this data that we are seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling, tasting, right? All of this data hits our neurology in massive, huge amounts. Something quite incredible at this point happens. Our unconscious mind starts to delete, distort, and generalize that information, stripping out tons and tons of details, stripping out what it deems to be non-essential data, and your unconscious mind may even, in some cases, make stuff up as well and see things that may or may not even exist. And this is all happening. Why is it happening? So that the interpretation, right, how you interpret your experience is most relevant to you. And all of this deleting and distorting and generalizing of your experience is totally done on an unconscious level without your conscious knowledge and leaving only what the unconscious mind believes is necessary for us to achieve our outcomes or to create an experience that fits within our paradigm or fits within our current model of the world. Next, so what happens next? So after we filter it, filter that information, we take that hugely filtered and greatly changed and diminished experience and we internalize it. We internalize it in the form of an unconsciously held internal representation of that event, an internal representation of that event, which all that means an internal representation is the the picture the representation or the perception of what your subjective experience is that you hold in your mind and that internal representation is made up of various different components it's made up of visual auditory kinesthetic gustatory and olfactory components which are the things that you've seen heard smelt um felt and tasted And your five senses become the components that get all stirred together in like this big cooking pot, if you will, that becomes this internal representation. Then next we apply labels. We label the experience with our language, which is the way that we describe that experience to both ourselves and to others. 
Now, in terms of describing things to ourselves internally, in terms of that internal dialogue, I think something that is important to realize is that whenever we speak to ourselves, whenever we communicate with ourselves in any way at all, we are communicating directly to the unconscious mind and providing it with suggestions and influencing our own behavior. So as you can see, it is really important to keep in mind the communication that we have with ourself is communication that can and has the potential to empower us to be the best that we can be. Our internal dialogue is so important because it is a direct communication to the unconscious mind. Okay, so let's backtrack a little bit again and let's go back to that external event or that data that comes in through our five senses. And I want you to get a really great picture and fully understand just how much data enters our neurology. Every second of the day, Every second, we are taking in information through our five senses, the things that we see, hear, feel, smell, taste, and touch. And that information that we're taking in comes at a rate of about 2 million bits of information per second. 2 million bits of data every second of every minute of every day. However, the human brain can only effectively process around 126 bits of data per second. Now that is a huge difference, isn't it? If you can imagine a picture, and just for a moment, maybe that picture represents the computer screen that you're looking at right now. And let's imagine that screen were made up of 2 million tiny dots of color or pixels. And then imagine I removed all of those tiny little pixels except for 126 of them. Then can you imagine what the result would be? That picture would look almost nothing like the original. You probably wouldn't even be able to tell what that was a picture of, right? It's a huge amount of lost data from our subjective experience. And that's exactly what it is, a subjective experience. What we perceive to be real in our own minds is a subjective experience. It's exactly that, purely subjective. This would explain, of course, why sometimes two different people may have completely different versions of the exact same event. You've noticed this, right? Maybe, for example, you and your friend are at a party and one of you recounts the evening to another friend. And you think to yourself, you look at your friend and you're like, that's not what happened, right? That's not what happened at all. And you've experienced this in many ways, right? Two people can go to the same movie or the same play or read the same book or have a same conversation and they both had a completely different experience because their experience has been filtered differently. Each person's uh, direct, like d each person's internal representation is different because each person is filtering that same experience in a different way. Now, I want you to look back at this diagram again. Our internal representation, as you see here, is directly tied to, linked to, and connected to our state. Emotionally, how we feel and our physiology, right? Our body, our body posture, our body language, all is connected to this internal representation. They're all woven together. And this together, this, this, this state that we're in, that this, that's caused by this internal representation, literally creates our outcomes. It creates our behavior, our results, our outcome, everything. Now, here is the empowering part of this diagram. If you want to change behavior, if you want to change results, if you want to change your life, work this puzzle backwards. If you change anything here on the right, right? If you change physiology, your body language, or if you change your emotional state, which we have tools to do that in NLP, 
or if you change your internal representation, there, you, thereby you will change and you will get different results. And in NLP, we're very much involved in changing the internal representation specifically. We do a lot of different processes and te techniques to help people change their internal representation through changing their filters and through changing their internal representation. representation. What we're going to do later in the week when we do timeline therapy is actually changing filters. We change the filters so that we have different re internal representations. And we do this so that we can give people the most compelling version possible, the most compelling internal representation so that they can feel their best, be their best, and create the results in their life that they want. This is what we do to help ourselves. This is what we do to help our clients so that they can have the most empowered viewpoint and have the ability to enrich their own lives. Now remember, here's an important thing and you might want to write this down. Whatever it is that you believe, whatever it is that you believe to be true about yourself, whatever issues that brought you here, whatever issues you're having in your life right now, I want you to know this. They're simply not true. Whatever you believe about yourself, your limitations, your issues, they're not true. What we believe to be real is quite simply only a perception of the events, a perception of what's real. It's all an illusion, right? This is like the matrix. Do you want the red pill or the blue pill? It's an illusion. And if we change all or any of the ingredients that enable us to make up these internal representa representations, we literally change the internal representation that creates a new state, that creates a new physiology, that creates a new behavior and therefore new results. Now I want to show you a video that really demonstrates this in action. Here we go. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it, but did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's hmm. the monkey business illusion. Okay. So that is a great example of how we delete, distort, and generalize the input that's coming in around us, and just how much are we missing out on as we shape what we believe and what our reality is. Okay, let's move on to probably one of the biggest themes in NLP. The first theme that we're going to talk about is the theme of cause and effect. This is quite possibly the most important principle in NLP and in all of personal, personal development, to be honest. The cause and effect equation states that a cause causes a certain effect. And what I mean by that is that there is a link between a cause event and a subsequent effect event, 
where the cause happens first and then there's a subsequent event that is the effect of that. And it really is an equation and it really becomes a question. And the question that I want you to ask yourself from here onward throughout your life and invite you to ask is which side of the equation am I on? Which side of the equation am I on? And how is that decision, which side to be on, how is that decision impacting my results? So we, we refer to the cause and effect equation a lot because it's vital. It's so important to living an empowered life. In NLP, we refer to people being either in living on one side or the other on, in, in this cause and effect equation. And what do we mean by that exactly? Well, we talk about pe be people being at cause or for their situation or at the effect of something in their life, depending on which side of the equation they're operating from. And the equation shows us that when you're on the side of cause, when you're on the cause side of the equation, that is the side of personal power and results. And it's the side of the equation where you might be saying something like, I am in charge. I am in charge of my mind and therefore my results. I determine my outcomes. I determine my mood. I am responsible for in a positive way and motivated way for every single outcome that I produce. On the flip side of that, we have the effect side of the, of the cause and effect equation. And that's where you're living on the effect of someone or something. And you hear people say things like, someone else did this to me. It wasn't me. It wasn't my fault. He made me do it. She did it, right? And of course, on the surface level, it's really easy to see. And you immediately can see just how much less empowering this is. Another way of looking at it is that you can either have results or you can have reasons. You can't have both, either results or reasons. And the effect side is the reasons. They're the reasons why those results aren't achieve, achieved. And the truth is that we are where we are in our life right now, we can all take an inventory of where we are in our life right now because of one thing, the decisions, because of the decisions that we've made both consciously and unconsciously at one level or another, another that have brought us to where we are right now. So while the cause and effect equation is super powerful, extraordinarily empowering, in my experience, it's not so popular. It's not so popular because for many people, their default is to operate from the effect side of the cause and effect equation. It wasn't my fault. If this hadn't happened to me, if only this hadn't happened to me, then X, Y, and Z would have happened to me instead. So people can be a little bit uncomfortable um, getting to the cause side because it's not generally what we want to do. It's not generally, we don't generally want to admit that we are responsible for all the things that happen to us, good, bad, and indifferent, right? So responsibility, let's talk about that word because for some that has a little bit of a negative connotation, which it's just a label. So let's dissect it, right? Responsibility is actually a great word. It's a fantastic word. And I love what Stephen Covey says about it because he says, he sums this up in his Seven Habits book when he talks about how responsibility is our ability to respond. It's our ability to respond. Our ability to respond to situations, to events, to people, and to do so positively in a way that gets us great results. If there is a mantra or an affirmation or something that you might want to consider committing to memory and saying to yourself often, I think it would be something like, I am responsible for my outcomes and only I can create my future. <clears throat> and here's the thing. Here's the empowering thing. If you're always at the mercy of external events, if you're always at the mercy of other people, 
if you're then it then then it's really quite difficult to have positive goals and to achieve those goals easily and effortlessly because you're not at cause for them someone else is the effect side has very little control over results at all because the results are reliant upon other people circumstances and other external events or outcomes whereas when you have total and utter responsibility for the successful achievement of your goals and everything that you want in life then you don't have a way out do you there's no excuse you never have that excuse of you know why you couldn't quite make it when you're at cause the buck stops with you and richard bandler one of the founders of nlp said and i love this quote who is driving your bus who's driving your bus are you letting external events and people drive your bus and determine your outcomes for you or are you driving your bus and this is something that requires people to be really honest with themselves and when they do amazing things start to happen they really do the lives literally change in an instant and internal representations can change in an instant i was working with a client one time by the way i'm probably going to share tons of stories with you guys this week because that's what i do so i was working with a client one time and and specifically one of the goals that she had was to be happy which is kind of interesting we won't go into that much because well if you're at cause for your own emotions then you can be happy now can't you so she was dealing with a lot of depression and anxiety and sadness and we after a couple of sessions helping her to get to cause for her reality to at cause for her perceptions her internal representation and everything that she was creating in her life she came to a session and she said i think i figured it out i've had an epiphany i've had a learning i've had an understanding I'm like okay well, what was it and she said i realized that on some level, consciously or probably unconsciously, on some level, I had decided to be depressed. And if I can decide to be depressed, then I can also have the power to undecide it. Because that, and that, you guys, that is the point of power. When we take responsibility for where we are, we have the power to change it. When it's someone else driving the bus, we don't have the power to decide what direction we go. Now, I know the next thing that comes up, right? And some of you are probably already thinking this and one step ahead of me and you're already asking, well, what about when someone has been really wronged? What if someone has been treated really badly, wronged by someone and they say, hey, I mean, I didn't do this. Really, I didn't. I did nothing to deserve what this person did to me. And look at me. Look at my life. Look at me now. I mean, how can I possibly take responsibility for what happened to me that caused me to be here? <laughs> okay. Let's talk about that. The thing is, I don't really know. I don't really know if we create all of the bad things that happen to us in our lives consciously. I do, though, know that again, we're the sum total of our conscious and our unconscious decisions. And that is what's brought us and led us to where we are right now in this moment. And we have the ability to be able to respond to those negative situations in whatever way we choose. So if you're feeling sad or you're feeling angry or you're feeling heartbroken because of what someone else or something has done to you, then I will tell you that it is you who is doing that. It's you who is choosing to feel that way in response to whatever it is that happened. And equally, it is you, and this is the empowering part, that has the power over those emotions to change those emotions and choose something different, to choose joy, to choose peace, to choose happiness. But being on the effect... Being on the effect is being the victim where you have no choices, you have no options. And I get it. Some people think that's an easier place to be, but it's not a more powerful place to be. It's not a more empowering place to be. 
I know you're here right now and you're listening to me because you are different, because you know this already somewhere inside of you and you're here to improve and to be different and to improve your life in some way. Now, related to this cause and effect equation and being wronged by someone and having a choice of what to do from that point forward, I want to tell you another story. So I was in a training event one time. I wasn't presenting. There was someone else doing, uh, leading the group. And it was um, regarding forgiveness. The segment that we were doing was regarding forgiveness. And there is an ancient Hawaiian uh, meditation technique that's called Ho'oponopono. You may have heard of it. Some of you may have heard of it. It's phenomenal. I use it all the time in my life. And we were about to go into doing this process and this meditation as a group. And in the group there, we had been together for a few days. And so we were kind of getting to know each other, the participants in this group. And just so you know, a little bit of background in this process, the person who has wronged you that you want to forgive or have forgiveness or just cut that energetic connection with comes to an imaginary stage out in front of you. And you imagine cutting that energetic connection. So As you're doing that, you actually say to yourself, I forgive you, you forgive me too, right? So there's this back and forth forgiveness. And um, anyway, so right before we got started, a girl in the group raises her hand and she says, wait, 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 I have a question. How do I know who to bring to the stage if I don't know who wronged me? And the person leading the group, as you're probably thinking right now, was like, Um, how do you not know who wronged you? Like we pretty much know, she said, no, 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 no. Let me explain. I was, um, I was, I was drugged and I was raped by someone and I don't know who they were. I don't have a name or a face. I don't know who they are. I don't know who to bring to the stage. Wow. That is someone who has really been hurt by someone else. That's someone who has really been wronged, right? And in a place where she can choose to be on the cause or the effect and say, look at what's happened to me. Look at my life. How could I, how could I go on? Right? Well, interestingly, that, so the, the person who was running the segment gives her some instructions and the girl sitting next to the girl who had been raped stands up and she is so mad. She's so upset and she's defending. She thinks she's defending the girl who had been wronged. She says, she shouldn't have to do this. She did nothing wrong. This is not her fault. She should not have to ask this person for forgiveness or have this, you know, two-way forgiveness. She doesn't owe him that, da, 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 da. And the girl who's been wronged looks to her and says, stop, stop. This has consumed my life and destroyed my life and I want to move past it. Whatever it takes, I am willing to do it. And if that's what it takes to be in a place of empowerment and take back control of my mind, I'm willing to try it. So she did. And the interesting thing is that up until that point, if you had looked at her thinking of this model of communication, thinking about how our internal representations affect our emotions, how they affect our body, our physiology, you could just look at her and know how how much she was hurting. You could look at her and know that she was sad and depressed by her body language and her shoulders and her head and the way she dressed and the way that she presented herself. You could just tell. And after she did this and her internal representations shifted right? Everything shifted for her. That, that's really what it was all about, was changing those filters, changing her internal representation. She came back in the next day completely different. No one even recognized her. She looked different, unrecognizable, body language different, appearances different. She was beautiful. She had a light. She was bright. She was a different human being. That's what I'm talking about. We have the choice Yes, sometimes, I don't know. I don't know if bad things, if we choose the bad things that happen to us, but we have a choice of how we're going to respond to them. And so while this can be uncomfortable for some people, I do think it really is the kindest thing that we can do for others to assist them in achieving what it is that they want to achieve in their life to get results. I think the kindest thing we can do is really help them to get to the side of the equation where they're at cause 
and they're driving their own bus. So keep in mind and remember, remember that. Who is driving your bus? Who is driving your bus? And the next time, you know, maybe something in your mind goes off and it's like, oh, he made me so mad or she made me so angry. No, he didn't. And no one can make you feel anything at all that you don't want to feel. So as you encounter these opportunities, now as you move on through life, I want you to remember this and I want you to catch yourself and move yourself constantly back over to the cause side of the equation and it will get easier and easier and easier for you to say to yourself, I am going to live at cause from this point forward. And when you do, you're going to see massive changes, instant changes and long-term changes in your life. So you're here right now and because you're here right now listening to me i know that you've already taken responsibility for getting results in your life to some degree and as you continue forward and as you continue to apply this cause and effect equation to other areas of your life you're going to be able to craft your life exactly as you want it with you firmly in the driver's seat of your bus okay that was the first major theme of NLP, and we're going to move on to the second major theme that we're going to be talking about today, which is perception is projection. So do you remember as a child people saying things like, it takes one to know one, and as it turns out, that may actually be more true than you probably once realized. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when you're happy, when you're cheerful, when you're energized, that everyone around you seems generally happy and cheerful? Have you noticed that your perception of other people is usually positive when you're feeling good and positive and energized yourself? You might even be thinking to yourself, wow, he or she is such a great person. And when you're really upbeat and happy and in a positive mood, have you noticed how generally overall People are really good people. However, what about the flip side? Have you ever had one of those days, you know, maybe where you woke up on the wrong side of the bed and you found, at least as far as you think, that in that moment, people suck. <laughs> They're not very nice. Well, here's the thing. These things are created and our reflections, simply reflections of our own internal state. Okay, remember the state? The great thing is that once you realize that everyone, everyone seems to be in a bad mood around you, all you need to do is take a moment and take a look in the mirror. Just take a glance in the mirror at yourself and then give yourself an honest opinion of the person that you see looking back at you from the mirror. And what has happened and what you'll see is that you've managed to turn everyone else into a clone of how of your own internal state. And here is the fun part and kind of wild part. The person that you think might be nasty might actually have a completely different view of you, different than the way that you've actually perceived them. And in their reality, you might actually appear to them as being perfectly happy, perfectly positive, really cheerful, because that's how they're feeling. Whoa, can you imagine that? Now, here is a key point, and I want to encourage you to write this down. If I don't know how to do an emotion or a state within myself, then I would not be able to notice it in other people. That is is a huge learning with layers of learning beneath it. You cannot perceive that which is not within you. Okay, you cannot perceive that which is not within you. You cannot notice or spot an emotion in others if that emotion is not within you yourself. If I didn't know what grumpy looks like, then I, and if I didn't know how to do it myself, I wouldn't be able to spot it or notice it in other people that I come in contact with. So what Carl Jung said is that perception is projection, which states that what you see in others is actually a reflection of yourself for the behavior that you perceive in others must be present in some way in order for you to recognize it. 
Think about that. Now, let's backtrack just a little bit back to the communication model. And remember, you are already leaving out so much information, right? We're filtering our experience through those filters. And what were those filters again? Oh, yeah. Our beliefs, our values, our experiences, our programming, our memories. So it's impossible for you to know the truth of a reality without it being shaped, remember, by your filters and your values. Everything, therefore, outside of you is you because it's being filtered through you. Your filters are just you. So what is being perceived is perceived through your filters. Your filters are just you. So therefore, the truth of the matter is we cannot see anything other than who we are. We cannot see anything other than who we are. Now, let's think about how that relates to working with other people with maybe you have a team, maybe you're in manager, in a manager of something, maybe you work with other people, maybe, maybe it's just your own family. So think about this. If you want to see potential in others, if you want to see incredible potential in other people, people that you're working with or living with, either, you know, in your job or whatever, if you want to see their incredible potential, you must believe it absolutely of yourself first. So let me give you an example of this in action. Again, I love stories, so here comes another one. I heard a story once about a school that took on a new teacher, and before the teacher went in to start her lessons, the teacher was told that the class was really dumb. This was the dumb class. They were at the bottom, bottom of the chart, and they were at the bottom of the pile in terms of education, the bottom in terms of intelligence. They were the slow children. They'd been labeled as virtually unteachable, okay? Now, the teacher had good intention. I think most people have good intentions. They're doing the best with what they know, and she went into that situation, um, you know, wanting to do her best. However, at the end of the school year, as you could predict, the class had predictably underachieved in just about every single area compared to the other classes, compared to their peers. No one was surprised by this. They, of course, wouldn't be, right? That's what you would expect. You see, the teacher who believed that the kids were unteachable projected that out onto them and confirmed their belief. Have you ever noticed how this sort of thing has happened in your life? Now, the story gets better because the next school year, they took the children that had been labeled slow, unteachable, all of that, right, from the previous year, and they moved them to a different class. They moved them to a different teacher. Only this time, the headmaster told the new teacher that he was being given the brightest, the smartest, the most intelligent kids in the whole school, and that they would be demanding because they constantly wanted to know more and, and have more and get more knowledge. Hmm, so what do you think happened? Well, now that teacher's belief that the children were super intelligent and that they were high achievers was actually projected onto them. And guess what? They achieved. They achieved great things that year. So we can play with perception as projection in a few other ways. <clears throat> a few of those sub-learnings that I've had over the last few years. First one is about jealousy. So this is kind of fascinating. If everything outside of me is me, then what is jealousy? If I am jealous of another person's attributes, their success, their achievements, their abilities, whatever it may be, if I am jealous of that, if perception is projection is true, why would you ever be jealous? Because wouldn't that be a bit like being jealous of yourself? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a bit like being jealous of yourself? Instead, we could flip that around and, and, and say, you know what? I want to see these incredible qualities in other people. I want to spot goodness in others because as I see these things in other people, 
that should be getting me excited because that means I have them in, within myself. If I see these attributes in others, that just means I either already possess them or have the ability to develop those attributes within myself. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to even recognize them in someone else. Now, another thing that sometimes people will play with, they'll say, oh my gosh, that behavior, that is so such an awful person. That person is just awful. That can't be me. That's not me. That is definitely not me. And Carl Jung would say to that, that it is actually definitely you. It is just the deepest, most hidden and unconscious part of you. Now, another thought to take this a little bit further is to think about why we have these projections. What is the purpose of projecting all of our perceptions out onto the world around us? And I'll tell you that it is so that you can learn, so that you can learn and experience life and improve and to grow. And as such, when you think about those people in your life that drive you crazy, right? Let's go ahead and just play that out. This person just makes me so mad. Well, first of all, you're not going to say that anymore because now you've implemented cause and effect and you know that no one can actually make you feel something you don't want to feel. But the second piece of that is if you play out perception as projection, then really what we should be doing is thanking those people that drive us crazy and make us so mad because they're our own projections. And if we were to take that and say, what is there for me to learn from this projection? then we have the opportunity to grow and to get better. So really, we should be thanking those people who are literally playing a role in our life play so that we can learn from our projections. That's the whole point of our projections. And let me promise you this. You can learn the lesson quickly or you, and easily and effortlessly, or you can learn the lesson the hard way. You can learn it over and over and over and over, and you can continue to have those same mistakes, those same experience, those same problems, those same things. If you're like seeming to have the same thing happen to you over and over again, I can tell you that there is, a, there is something you're not learning. And the sooner that you learn whatever it is that you need to learn from that experience, the sooner you can get the lesson and you can stop having that experience again and again. Okay, that's perception is projection. Let's move on to the next theme, which is the neurotransmitter and how the neurotransmitter works in creating the mind-body connection. All right, so neurotransmitter. Let's look at how the mind influences the body and vice versa. So the human nervous system is really complex, right? And hugely fascinating. And I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible today. All across the human nervous system, we have neurons, and these neurons carry information. They carry signals from one place in our body to another place, and these neurons are all linked up together throughout our entire nervous system, connecting all parts of the nervous system together. So when you blink, it's the neurotransmitter that you have that has that you have that has ultimately communicated the message to blink from your unconscious mind to the muscles in your eyes. When you produce hormones, it's the neurotransmitters that communicates a need to produce them from the unconscious. And neurons are quite literally electric. So when a neuron is stimulated, it instantly produces an electrical stimulus, an electrical impulse, which is used to communicate messages all across the nervous system. So when neurons were first discovered, it was thought that they only existed in the brain until after the Penfield studies of 1957. So let me explain. Who was Penfield? Penfield was a doctor and a researcher who was looking for the causes of epilepsy, and he wanted to find a cure. And one of his exper experiments that he did, he was working with a female patient, and he drilled a hole into her skull enabling him to place a small electrode on the brain to stimulate the brain. Now, he was looking for a cure for epilepsy. However, what he discovered quite by accident was that as he applied the stimulus to a certain part of her brain, she was able to recall all of the details from her 
birthday party when she was only two years old, okay? She could recall the everything, the sounds, the sights, the smells, the taste of her birthday cake, the way her dress felt across her skin, the way her parents looked at that age. Every detail, in fine detail, was there a complete and total recall of this memory from when she was only two years old. Now, Penfield was really excited about this because he believed that he had found the root of all memory. And he wrote about it in the Penfield studies of 1957. And he documented his belief that all memory was stored in the brain and that we store every experience that we've ever had. Now, he was part right. The truth is that further studies revealed that we do, in fact, record every single experience that we've ever had, every single memory, every single emotion that we've ever created. That's actually going to get part of our discussion tomorrow when we talk about the unconscious mind. However, we don't just hold this information in the brain as Penfield had postulated. In fact, Carl Prebram, just a few years later, stated that memory is stored holographically all throughout the entire body and is communicated through the neurotransmitter so that every cell in your body, every cell holds every memory that you've ever stored. Now stop and think about that for a moment. Every cell holds every memory that you've ever stored. And this is what was proven when doctors did some experiments on rats later on and they um what they did is they they created a maze for the rats to navigate through this maze from start to finish and at the finish they would get a reward and so they had to learn the path through the maze to get the reward over time the rats followed the same path the same path the same path to get to the reward well, then the doctors decided, let's see what happens if we remove part of their brain. So they started removing little pieces of the brain and see what, to see what would happen. Well, they removed a little bit of the brain. The rats followed the same path. They made it, got the reward. Removed a little bit more. They followed the same path, got the reward. They continued until they had removed the entire brain except for the brain stem and they were able to follow the exact same path that they had learned to get to the reward. Um, proving, of course, that the memory of the maze, the memory of traveling through the maze, was stored in the rat itself. So now let's look at how that actually works with the neurotransmitters. Let's break this down a little bit more, and we'll do it really super fast and simple, okay? So if it helps, you can relate this to things that are more maybe commonly recognizable for you. You might say that the axon, this part of the, the, the neuron, right? The axon is like a cable and it carries an electrical current, which in fact it does. And just like a cable, it's insulated in a plastic sheath. The axon is insulated from its surroundings by a sheath. At the end of the axon are nerve endings. And you can see these are a little bit like exposed wires, aren't they? like from an electrical cable. These nerve endings are where the communication is passed from one neuron to another neuron or to an organ, for example, or a muscle. Now, in the case of a neuron, these neurons don't actually connect to each other. They don't actually touch. The two neurons don't exactly come together. There's a gap between them. The two neurons don't meet. There's a, a gap between them called a synaptic gap. And communication must hop over this gap to be able to continue its journey throughout carrying these impulses throughout the nervous system to where they're designated to go. So when it reaches this gap, what helps it cross this gap? Well, that's the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitters are a little bit like little rowboats that take the information from one nerve ending to the next nerve ending, right? The two neurons to, to, to piece them together. So that is very briefly very simply what's going on inside of us at all times. Now, Deepak Chopra in his book, Quantum Healing, I think in 86 or something like that, he talks about the mind-body connection and shows us that neurotransmitters literally bathe every cell of the body. This is super important, you guys, because what this shows us is that the neurotransmitter travels 
freely around the nervous system all the time, whether we're awake, whether we're sleeping, whether we're working, playing with our kids, whether we're meditating, eating, whatever we're doing, it's touching every single neuron, every single cell, every synaptic gap in the entire body is bathed with these neurotransmitters. And of course, this provides the the explanation for the phenomenon of the mind-body connection, which is the mechanism by which the mind or your internal representations that you hold in your mind and your thoughts, your thinking, the thoughts that you have that are correct, directly communicating with your unconscious mind, how they directly impact your entire body. Therefore, of course, the mind affects the body, the whole body. Every single cell, muscle, organ is affected directly by the impulses that are flowing across those synaptic gaps in your nervous system, all of which are created and directed by your unconscious mind. So you may have heard people say things like, oh, it's all in your head. It's just all in your mind, right? Well, now you know that it isn't, is it? If you're having certain thoughts that are empowering you, then it's not all in your mind. It's in all of all of you because of the mind-body connection. Now, here's the last thing I want you to think about with this. As we've established, neurotransmitters touch every and bathe every single cell in your body, right? We know this now. Now, think about this. That means that every thought you think, every belief you hold, Every emotion that you carry, positive or negative, has an influence. Every thought you think has an influence on your body. And if that's true, which I know that it is, and you have 90,000 some odd thoughts a day, are those thoughts through that are those thoughts that are through the neurotransmitters bathing every cell in your body? How many of those thoughts are toward what you want? how many of those thoughts are toward what you don't want? My goodness, right now, think about, you know, health. Think about the health that you want. Are we focusing on health? Are we focusing on sickness, right? It's really simple. If you're focusing on doubt or fears or negative emotions, if you're focusing on sickness, or if you're so focusing on health or wellness, or if you're thinking on stuff, something that's, if you're thinking and focusing on things that are not so resourceful, then you're focusing on things that you don't want. And those things through your neurotransmitters are transmitting that information to the rest of your body. And this is why when you focus on what you don't want, you get more of what you don't want. And if you focus on what you want, you get more of what you do want. This is why if you ever come to one of my trainings in person, which some of you may come to some of my trainings live in person, and I'd love to have you, you're going to hear me say things like, focus on what you want, or what do you want instead? Okay, but what do you want? What do you want instead? And it's because Henry Ford said long ago, whether you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. And this, I think, in my opinion, is why some people will heal succeed, why they'll have great relationships, and why others won't. What is that information that they're sending through this mind-body connection? So we need to be in charge of our focus and therefore our results. And when you play out cause and effect, like we've been talking about today, and when we take full responsibilities for all of our outcomes, that means we're taking responsibility for our thoughts and our internal representations as well. Okay, one more concept for today um, that in, in these themes, one more big theme for today, and that is the responsibility for change and the responsibility for value. Now, you've heard people say something like, oh, he makes me so mad, or she makes, my girlfriend makes me really happy. Now, now you know, right? Now you know that that statement isn't true, is it? When I hear people say things like this, like, he makes me so blank, blank, blank. I kind of, in my mind, I kind of giggle a little bit. And sometimes I say it out loud and sometimes I don't. But I have to kind of say to myself, wow, that's really amazing. Like, how are they actually doing that, making you so mad? 
Because if someone were to really make you angry, they would need to take over your unconscious mind and control it consciously. They would need to produce adrenaline for you and, and, and take control of your muscles and your physiology, which of course, can they actually do? No. So when people say he is making me so angry, what that really means is I'm choosing to respond to the perception and the internal representation that I've created through my filters by producing tense or aggressive behavior. That's really what it means, which also means if I've chosen to do that, then I can also choose to do something else altogether, like choose peace, choose calm, choose love, choose something different. Now, this is an important concept theme that we talk about in NLP because NLP isn't the magic wand. It's not. It's not the magic. It looks like magic. If you come to my trainings and you see me take someone like um, my friend McKay and you see me take, you know, we did a, a, tra a technique one time and she had an obsession with Nutella and in 10 minutes later she despises Nutella, right? Because we changed an internal representation or where I've taken a phobia that someone's had of spiders and we've been able to turn it off like that in 10 minutes or a fear of flying that someone's had their whole life that's prevented them from being able to travel to go to family reunions and weddings and have it be gone in minutes, right? It looks like magic, but it's not magic. NLP practitioners cannot do things to people. I cannot do anything to you. You're here because you already have chosen to create change and you're already changing and you're becoming more empowered by the minute. But I am not the cause of that. I am only showing you the way. The actual responsibility, the responsibility for change, the responsibility to get what you want lies within who? Who? yourself. So the results that you'll get or not get this week as we do this work together, it's not going to be NLP. It's not going to be me that creates that work. It's going to be you. The first, you have to choose to play full out. You're going to have to choose to set aside your own doubts. You're going to have to choose to do the processes at 100%. Because NLP is a do with process, not a do to process. And ultimately, it's you that has to do the process. So if you're thinking about sitting back with your arms crossed, having a bunch of other screens open and distractions and the TV on and all these other things going on in your household and saying, well, go ahead then, make it happen, change me, then you honestly are going to be sitting there waiting for a really long time. However, if you open your mind to these principles and these processes that I have shared with you today and will continue to share with you this week, and if you're willing to follow the steps without criticism, without judgment, and have an open mind, you will achieve great things this week and you'll get great, great value from being here. And that goes for everything in life, you guys. Everything we do it's us that have to take responsibility for the value that we get, whether it's a product that we buy, a computer that we buy, whether it's a vacation that we take, a movie that we go to, a course we take, or a book that we read, the um, responsibility for the value we receive is ours. It's like I could go to Costco right now and buy a Vitamix blender or a Blendtec, you know, a top of the line blender, come home and stick it in my pantry and never take it out of the box and say, and then call Costco, right? Call Costco the next day and say, this blender stinks. It didn't make me any smoothies today. It didn't do anything for me, right? And blame the blender. But I'm the one that didn't take it out of the pantry. I'm the one that didn't put it on the counter and put the vegetables in it. So when it comes to responsibility for value, we should talk probably about one more thing, okay? Let's talk about money. I mean, why not, right? We all like a little more money in our life, yeah? Now, money is an interesting thing. It's just pieces of paper. But what it represents, it represents work, it represents effort, it represents value, and these are all energetic principles. So here's the thing, when you gladly spend and share your money for goods and services that you're getting the value from, 
and you're seeking to get value from those things that you purchase and spending the money freely on the things that you value, then what you're projecting out into the world is abundance. You're projecting out abundance and it will come back to you tenfold. In doing so, you will quite literally and without meaning attract money back to you. And of course, that isn't really normally what most people are doing in the world. Normally, we kind of like uh, resent, right? Having to part with our cash. Oh, take it, take it. No, no, just kidding. No, no, no. Again, no, just kidding, right? Like, oh, can you just give me like 50% off today, right? And some people have to literally pry it, you know, out of our fingers. But I want you to think about that and think about and look at the projection that that sends out into the world. And then you start to get an understanding as to why it is that so many people think money can be so hard to earn, so hard to keep. So when you, so when you move forward and in the future, as you purchase items, make sure that they meet your values, they meet your expectations, they meet your desires, give the money gladly for them as a positive exchange of energy and then seek to find the value in whatever it is that you're purchasing. And when you do that, that will what that projects and sends out comes back to you tenfold. And when you do that, I promise you, it you'll see the difference and materialize in your own bank account. Now, NLP is really about excellence. We talk a lot about excellence. You can look at all the great business leaders in the world and they have something in common. They're always striving for better. They're always striving to be more excellent. Becoming excellent is an evolution. It's something that we exist only through a difference of what it is not. So there's always a way to strive for growth and something more and something greater. So my goal for you really is to open your mind to a higher standard of excellence for yourself. And when you learn something new this week, really learn it. Get the value from it. Study it so that it becomes part of you. Now to wrap this up today, I want to close by talking about beliefs. It's our last subject. <clears throat> and I want you to show you how beliefs influence our behavior. And we'll be coming back to beliefs throughout the week. Most likely this will come up a couple of times. But for now, I want to talk to you for a moment about how powerful these beliefs and opinions are that we hold and how you can use them to your advantage and use them to enhance your efficiency so that you get better results in your life. There are four characteristics to a belief. First, number one, beliefs are not real. Whatever you believe to be true about yourself, your limitations, all those things that we talked about, whatever beliefs you have, beliefs are not real. Beliefs by definition must have some basis in faith or trust or an element of make-believe. And we hold a motivation for those beliefs that we hold at a very deeply unconscious level. Number two, Secondly, whether that belief is true, whether it's not true, it is not relevant to the person who holds it. If they're not open to change, if they're closed off to alternative thinkings or, or, or internal representations or ideas, if they're not open to changing their values, it doesn't matter how hard you attempt to convince them that they're wrong, they will maintain that belief. And in some instances, even defend that belief to the death. Just take a look, for example, at religion and history and how protective people are about their religious belief system. Third, the person who holds the belief will act as if it is true, regardless of whether or not they have any evidence to back it up. They will act as if it's true. The person who holds the belief acts as if it's true with no knowledge that it actually is so. And this produces some interesting results. First of all, the unconscious mind, you guys, the unconscious mind is a hugely powerful, um, we're going to get into this tomorrow. I'm not going to go into much detail right now, but it's, it's hugely powerful, but it is not the place for logic. Logic is the domain of the conscious mind. The unconscious mind really pretty much just does as it's been told and taught and trained by you. And herein lies the magic of what you'll encounter with things like NLP, timeline therapy, hypnosis, because wouldn't it be quite useful if you absolutely believed 
with no, with wholeheartedly believed that you were incredibly worthy. If you were a capable individual destined for massive, massive success, wealth, goodness, prosperity, joy, and love in your life, would that not serve you? And if you believed that, and you would act it as if it were true, which you would, because that's the third element of belief. If you act as though that were true, how would that change your outcomes, your internal representations, your, your state, your, your physiology? How would it change your behavior? How would it change your outcomes if you acted as if it were true? Which leads me to number four, beliefs are self-fulfilling prophecies because we act as if they're true. Beliefs are self-fulfilling prophecies. And so for, they are for the, for the simple fact that holding a conscious belief will instruct the unconscious mind to go out, to delete, distort, and generalize all of that two million bits of information, right? The conscious belief that you hold is literally instructing the unconscious mind, delete, 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 and only show us the evidence that our belief is true and what it is that suits this and fits within this paradigm, this belief within this conscious belief that we hold. Therefore, beliefs become self-fulfilling prophecies. In short, beliefs are a filter that filter our reality and create our behavior and our, and our, and our results. Now, you already know this to be true because you've had these experiences in your life where you're like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do X, Y, Z. That's way, no way I could do that. And we prove ourselves to be true, don't we? Whereas we've had other experiences where we look at something and we go, I, with every fiber of my being, I will achieve X, Y, Z. And we do that too. So that wraps up foundation, day number one, of this introduction to NLP and timeline therapy. That was a lot. That was a lot of foundation. That was a lot of information. Feel free to go back and listen to this again. Maybe take notes again the second time. Um, and feel free to share this with others that you think would benefit. In the next segment, in the next video, um, in the next time we meet, we're going to dig more into understanding the unconscious mind, the roles of the unconscious mind, and you'll get introduced to your timeline. So I do want to leave you with one challenge before I wrap up, because that's usually what I do with most of my coaching clients. I want to leave you with a challenge to set a goal for this training, set a goal. And if you feel like sharing that goal, feel free to share that goal with me. You can do that privately. You can, you can share it in our group. If you feel brave, you can send it to me as a private message. Um, but think of a goal that you'd like to walk away from this training with some, some change that you want to make in your life and share it with someone else. Thank you so much for being here. This was a lot of fun. I love the, this work. I love the changes that I see in people all around me. And I think, I, I think becoming more empowered, applying the principles that we talked about today is the secret to becoming a more empowered version of yourself that gets the results that you're wanting to get. Till next time, you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Love you all. Bye-bye.